thanks for coming on this uh, rainy Saturday. Um, I would like to uh, ex also express my uh, my thanks my, uh, uh, to everyone at Buck, to Maria in particular for uh, inviting me to, or for asking me to propose um, uh, the subject of this book and I would also like to thank Marion of course uh, for giving us the opportunity. I will, um, um, the, the, the talk I prepared, pre prepared is something maybe a bit or slightly abstract uh, as a starter, as a startup for this day. I don't, uh, I, I, won't I won't reiterate, won't repeat what I've written in uh, the essay for the book, uh, so I'm not presenting, I'm not going to present uh, Marion's practice in its uh, detail, but I will kind of constantly refer in a way to what Marion is doing. So this is, uh, I hope this uh, is still concrete enough to follow the kind of ideas or, to, or, the, or the, 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 the kind of thread of argument I would like to lay out as rather tentatively, and it's a, it's a work in progress, departing from uh, the work <coughs> on the book and uh, around certain notions such as production, cultural production, knowledge production, etc. cetera. Um, my initial question is really what uh, what would be the or what could be the sort of criticism of uh, scholarship of methodology uh, required to productively assess a practice that refuses to be ranked and filed in a single disciplinary rubric in critically considering contextualizing and reading marion's practice have we cultivated and deployed particular competences, particular skills, a particular professionalism in evaluating the outcomes of a practice, outcomes which may well be coinciding with that very practice? Moreover, what do we mean when we speak of cultural production and cultural producers? What is it that makes production an alluring concept, again maybe, in contradistinction to say curating, exhibiting, painting, designing, creating. And should we not rather speak by default almost of co-production or to use the more common term in contemporary art discourse of collaboration. Another relevant and contested term for our discussion often squeezed together with production is knowledge. Meanwhile, we look back on far more than a decade of controversies that relate to the ways in which contemporary art is being remodeled on the level of exhibition making in higher education as knowledge production. There's also a reader in, uh, uh, ex, um, published by Buck on this very notion. <clears throat> uh, often parading, knowledge production often parading in the guises of adjacent terms such as investigative arts or artistic research. Can we be more precise and nuanced when speaking about the very things which practices that claim to overcome the divides of fine art, applied art, art, politics, aesthetics, epistemology, etc., actually deal with? What are these things anyway? Experiences, knowledges, soci sociabilities, struggles, spatialities, economies? And if they are of such different and wide-ranging order, what, I what is it that makes considering them in the institutional frameworks of contemporary art a promising endeavor at all? The book we are presenting today uh, has been in the making for quite some time, almost three years actually, Mar Maria mentioned it already. When Maria asked me back in summer, autumn 2014, if I could imagine to propose a practitioner and her, his practice to be featured in the second volume of Buck's Critical Reader and Artist, Artist Practice series, uh, I suggested Marion von Osten, knowing well that Maria, uh, Maria and Marion have been working together on uh, the Former West project and at other occasions. Since the early days of Former West around 2008, which also coincides with the financial crisis, uh, but also since we started to think and plan more concretely to the book on Marion, many of the political, economical, cultural, technological, and socio-psychological parameters have shifted significantly. Today, 
the situation in Europe and on a global scale, if it is possible to speak of a situation, is almost incompatible with the, the, with the situation three years ago. That's at least what you're supposed to think after Brexit, Trump, Macron, etc. History being replaced by disruptive seriality, occasionally masquerading as revolution. However, from a viewpoint less eager to privilege disruption over structural perseverance, most processes simply continue, at times accelerating, at times slowing down. To only name a few of these slow-burning, yet ubiquitous developments, the multiple financial and debt crisis, the geopolitics of, austeri of, of austerity and asymmetry, climate change, disaster capitalism and wars against the poor, nationalist fortress building and the constantly invisibilized reality of the Mediterranean mass grave, as well as the ongoing deep mutation of modes of living into data structural complexes, the digital makeover of subjectivity and the advent of big data superjects, as Deleuze and Matteo Pasquinelli call the new superior collective agency emerging from the expansive global topology of server farms. Marian's always already collective, non-hierarchical, genre-defying practice could be said to have originated in the late 1980s before the West became former. However, attending to the unfolding and complexification of this practice is and should be, as I would like to argue, an exercise in historical reasoning. This practice never stopped to respond to changing conditions and requirements to interact with developments in feminist and post-colonial theory to adapt to the uh, emergence of communication technologies such as the internet to participate in educational turns and curatorial reinventions of the exhibitionist discourse. Hence, turning to its durational dimension and trying to understand its underlying logics, urgencies and necessities may help to put the current union unison chorus of the age of uncertainty into perspective. Among the many reasons to uh, propose Marion's name to Buck and Maria was the conspicuous lack of any in-depth reflection on her multifarious, multidisciplinary translocal practice and the immediate doubts or afterthoughts occurring in the very moment one addresses this practice as work or its products as works in the traditional meaning of artworks. In the mode of cultural production embodied by Marion and many others, the author certainly is always already a producer committed to a post-Brechtian umfunktionierung, functional transformation of the conventions, techniques, means and forms of art. When Walter Benjamin in April 1934 gave his address on the author as producer at the Institute for the Study of Fascism in Paris, he cited the example of Sari Tretyakov and his productivist notion of the operating rather than informing writer-artist who inserts herself in the industrial production, intervenes rather than reports. Benjamin said he cited, he, Benjamin said he cited the example of Tretyakov deliberately, quote, in order to point out how comprehensive the horizon is within which we have to rethink our conceptions of literary forms or genres in view of the technical factors affecting our present situation if we are to identify the forms of expression that channel the literary energies of the present. Benjamin was convinced that we are in the midst of a mighty recasting of literary forms, a melting down in which many of the opposites in which we have been used to think may lose their force. Drawing on Brecht, he famously argued that the goal of a post-bourgeois and post-art cultural production should be the socialist transformation of the apparatus of production which implies the deprivileging of subjective authorship in favor of structural and infrastructural change. In the words of Brecht himself, certain work, works ought no longer to be individual experiences have the character of works, but should rather concern the use, transformation of certain institutes and institutions. Elaborating on this trans-individual and transformative proposition Benjamin calls for the transcending of specialization in the process of intellectual production. As the barriers imposed by specialization must be breached jointly by the productive forces that they were set up to divide. The author as producer discovers, even as he discovers his solidarity with the proletariat, his solidarity with certain other producers who earlier seemed scarcely to concern him. End of quote. 
Leaving the zones of arts, disciplines, and academic pigeonholing informs and sets up the sort of production which not only accompanies and agitates the laboring masses in their struggle for socialism, but actively joins the struggle via the redefinition and recomposition of practice in the pursuit of Umfunktionierung. Becoming concerned with other producers is a logical, but certainly no inevitable outcome of the critique and overcoming of specialization, as it presupposes interest, curiosity, empathy beyond individual concerns, ambitions and professionalisms, a circumstance that, by the way, may be the appropriate object of an anthropology and a psychology of transversal cultural production beyond the confines of art. Considering how Marian and others favor the term cultural producer over that of artist or curator, it might be tempting to draw a direct line from such claims to production to the late 1920s, early 1930s productivist moment of Tretyakov, Avatov, Brieg, Benjamin or Brecht, revisited lately by neo-Marxist critics and art historians such as John Roberts, Kerstin Starkermeyer or Maria Goff. But not only has the Fordist factory of the early 20th century been supplemented and often replaced, though certainly not on a global scale, by the distributed or social factory in that the principles of capitalist value extraction and exploitation of labor power are operative in all areas of life, from the sites of industrial production to the institutions of culture, the museum, the cinema, and the topology of post fordist scenes of dig digital virtuosity and flexible flexibilized labor time and space, Moreover, one could argue, as John Roberts does, that the hierarchical side of labor capital uh, relations and the value form, the factory, is not, contrary to what Soviet productivists thought, the primary side of arts, value, arts use values, the place where art will fully emancipate itself through productive labor and, and its instrumental outcomes. The notion that the liberation of art from bourgeois relations to, is, is compatible is compatible with its entry into the labor process, a recurring fantasy of those who would want to ally artistic labor completely with general social technique. Instead, for Roberts, the factory is the destinal site of art's critique of the value form, the place where aesthetic thinking as the critique of the value form must enter eventually, the place where free labor inscribed in art must arrive sometime in order to confront and challenge the alienations and routinizations of productive and non-productive labor itself, material and immaterial alike. Such Adornian reasoning about art as the vessel, the embodiment of free labor and the enactment of aesthetic thinking as critique of the value form may not be entirely in sync with the cultural producer's defiance of any theory that continues to invest in such a notion of art as utopian promise of liberated labor power and the superior epistemic quality that would come with it. However, the question remains, what would, what would be the very kinds of changes to be pursued by the expansion of art or its dissolution into cultural production, both on a macro, macro and on a micro level, on the level of the general social technique and on the level of a specific community and its needs and desires. To speak about what Marion does and makes and what an increasing number of cultural practitioners seems to be doing and making for decades, other terms than work are probably more useful, timely and at place, although the, di although the dimension of act actual material physical work is far from absent here. Since work in the sense of a work of art and work as an activity of goal-oriented or instrumental, as Hannah Arendt put it, making and doing are very different categories, it could be argued that the kind of activity we're trying to address when speaking of the cultural producer's practice is indeed to be considered as a work of sorts, and maybe this work even shows affinities to free labor as the ultimate contradiction critique of work in the social factory of capitalism. But let's first for a moment return to the notion of the artwork, this uh, tenacious, tenacious vestige, regardless of its being tirelessly deconstructed as hapless metaphysical entity and most peculiar of commodities, since attending to its ontology and even more to its epistemology may prove to be of use for an understanding of the knowledge politics of cultural production. In her 1958, The Human Condition, Hannah Arendt characterizes works of art as 
the, as the quote, most intensely worldly of all intangible, all tangible things. Their durability, their, their durability is of a higher order than that of which all things need in order to exist at all. It can attain permanence throughout the ages. Such permanence and durability is certainly less of an issue in the realm of cultural, political, exhibi ex exhibitionary and organizational practices we are talking about today. Rather, for Marian and like-minded cultural practitioners, process arguably, arguably prevails over product, the transience of collaborations, regardless whether they lead to lasting infrastructural, sociological, pedagogical or epistemological results, being of a different categorical order than, that, than the transcendental status of works of art in, Hara, in, in Hannah Arendt. However, with Arendt, one could argue for a sustainable model of the object of art, representing permanence rather than fantasy, collectivity rather than possessive individualism, solidarity rather than projection. Such a model implies a difference between reification, the process in which works acquire a value of permanence, and commodification, the process in which they become objects of consumption. Here, in its emphasis on collectivity, publicness and a use value that is beyond capitalism's grasp, Arendt's model of the work of art as simultaneously material and immaterial may gain some traction for our discussion of those contemporary cultural practices that move unboundedly and de-disciplinarily across the art-non-art -art spectrum. What's more, Arendt, in her reflections on the work of art, introduced the concept of the thought thing in relation to artworks. In Arendt's view, the artwork is primarily a physical thing imbued with metaphysical temporality and existence, but theoretically conceived as a thought thing, it is irreducible in terms of a dialectic du duality between object and subject, as Cecilia Sjöhern argues in a recent book on Arendt's aesthetic thinking. Understood this way, Art cannot be exhausted in its objecthood in relation to a subject. It belongs to the field of plurality, situated in a field of shared perspectives, usages, and impacts. The ontological conception of plurality together with its phenomenological implications serves to rethink political categories in aesthetic terms. The humanist focus on human agency and human actions is displaced and renegotiated toward phenomena, things, and objects that condition the political. Arendt continues in The Human Condition, the thought process by itself no more produces and fabricates tangible things such as books, paintings, sculptures or compositions than usage by itself produces and fabricates houses and furniture. The reification which occurs in writing something down, painting an image, modeling a figure or composing a melody is of course related to the thought which preceded it, but what actually makes the thought, of thought a, real a reality and fabricates things of thought is the same workmanship which, through the primordi primordi primordial instrument of human hands, builds the other durable things of the human artifice. While the mention of the various activities of art making, writing, painting, modeling, composing may appear limited to us as we've, been, we've become accustomed to be more or less radical, to the more or less radical expansion of modes, media and contexts of art making and cultural practices in, in the past century or so, Arendt's notion of reification, Verdinglichung or Versachlichung could become helpful. Quite different from Marx's concept of reification, which specifies the dialectical relationship between social existence and social consciousness, that is between objective social relations and the subjective apprehension of those relations in a society dominated by commodity production, Arendt conceives reification as transformation from thought into thing, in the case of art into a thought thing. Arendt makes it very clear that she doesn't want to have thought mixed up with any utilitarian notion of knowledge, and it is not even to be confused with cognition or thinking, the former, that is cognition, manifesting itself in the acquisition and storage of knowledge in the sciences, whereas the latter, that is thinking, for Arendt is, a rel is, is as relentless and repetitive as life itself. She writes, cognition always pursues a definite aim which can be set by practical considerations as well as by idle curiosity, but once this aim is reached, the cognitive process has come to an end. Thought, on the contrary, has neither an end nor an aim outside itself, and it does not even produce results. 
not only the utilitarian philosophy of Homo Faber, but also the men of action and the lovers of results in the sciences have never tired of pointing out how entirely useless thought is, as useless indeed as the works of art it inspires. And not even to these useless products can thought lay like claim, for they can hardly be called the results of pure thinking, strictly speaking, since it is precisely the, precisely the, the thought process which the artist or writing philosopher must interrupt and transform for the materializing reification of his work. Thought, therefore, is a fluid, elusive entity, hardly accountable for, essentially distributed and shared in the collective, impossible to be possessed or commodified, no one's intellectual property but a common feat or a feat of commonality. As such, thought is the condition of cultural production but remains an always receding, irreducible ground of reification which cannot be detected isol or isolated and hence appropriated in or through the work on the works. Although thought, as Arendt puts it, inspires the highest worldly productivity of Homo Faber, it is by no means his prerogative. It begins to assert itself as his source of inspiration only where he overreaches himself, as it were, and begins to produce useless things, objects which are unrelated to material or intellectual wants, to man's physical needs, no less than to his thirst of knowledge, thirst for knowledge. In contradistinction to thought, cognition, are in contents, belongs to all and not only to intellectual or artistic processes. Like fabrication itself, it is a process with a beginning and end whose, use, whose usefulness can be tested in which, if it produces no results, has failed, like a carpenter's workmanship has failed when he fabricates a two-legged table. The cognitive processes in the sciences are basically not different from the function of cognition and fabrication. Scientific results produced through cognition are added to the human artifice like all other things. So if cognition belongs to all, as Arendt puts it, what's wrong with it? Why do humans need the useless thought thing? Precisely because they don't need it. And in not needing it, paradoxically, lies its collective dimension, a collectivity that doesn't survive the individualizing forces of commodified culture. On a more epistemological note, it is a particular freedom of thinking that constitutes a collectivity. Aren't not unlike the proponents of the notion of a freedom of labor force to be accomplished in the autonomy of the modern art work, conceives of the liberated thought thing that is art as thought liberated from the coercion that concepts exert on the mind. The thought thing produced in productive material and immaterial at the same time is a form of intransience attached to sensible qualities but clearly and radically divided ontologically from the sphere of instrumental reason and nature's constraints. However, it is also a place a realm, an arena of unfettered activity. Quote, in order to be what the world is always meant to be, a home for men, men during their life on earth, the human artifice must be a place fit for action and speech, for activities not only entirely useless for the necessity of life, but of, of an entirely different nature from the manifold activities of fabrication by which the world itself and all things in it are produced. The measure can be neither the driving necessity of biological life and labor, nor the utilitarian instrumentalism of fabrication and usage." End of quote. Does this mean the thought thing is a sort of guarantee against the tendency towards inhumanity? Well, not really. Aaron's fragmentary aesthetics invites us to think beyond the human. It potentially includes phenomena and materialities of a very different kind. Yet it is culture and cultural production that Arendt is interested in as a bulwark against dehumanizing or inhumanizing developments. Having surrendered to the commodification and financialization of everyday life, culture for Arendt has been dragged under the spell of capitalist rationalization and automation and will therefore no longer be of much, of much help in protecting freedom, action and reflection. The thought thing therefore needs to be rescued, reconstructed, retroactively animated. Which brings me back to production and to the question of knowledge. Pierre Macharet, a literary critic and student of Althusser, who as a member of Telquel became one of the most prolific protagonists of a neo-productivist neo turn in structuralist aesthetic theory during the 1960s, 
insisted on the necessity to move from a subject and author-oriented conception of art to a strong notion of collective production, a notion that was supplemented by a shift from the concept of work to that of text. For Macheret, the writer, as the producer of a text, does not manufacture the materials with, with which he, and he's always in the mail uh, register here, with which he works. Neither does he stumble across them as spontaneously available wandering fragments useful in the building of any sort of edifice. They are not, not neutral, transparent components which have the grace to vanish, to disappear into the totality they contribute to giving its substance and adopting its forms. The causes that determine the existence of the work are not free implements useful to elaborate any meaning. They have a sort of specific weight, a peculiar power, which means that even when they are used and blended into a totality, they retain a certain autonomy and may, in some cases, resume their particular life. Not because there's some absolute and transcendent logic of aesthetic facts, but because their real inscription in a history of forms means that they cannot be defined exclusively by their immediate function in a specific work. The necessity of the work, if it is an objective determination, is not one of its natural properties, the index of the presence of a model or an, or an intention. The necessity of the work is not an initial datum, datum, but a product at the point where several lines of necessity converge. You may probably wonder why Macheret's rescue operation in the service of the autonomy of the text of half a century ago, as much as, his, as this operation may have been critical of the author function of intentionality, expressive causality, and the realist theory of reflection, should be of any relevance to our current questioning of the relationships between thought, knowledge, work, production, and, institution, and, institu and institutionality with regard to transversal cultural practices. Well, my guess is that the argument's basic claim still, hold, still holds, that the autonomy, power, and necessity of a practice, to what extent it may be recognized as art or not, is to be appreciated as a historical fact, as resulting from a history of forms, be they aesthetic, social, or political. Which brings me back to the question asked at the beginning, what are the skills and competencies required to product to productively assess a new, a different genre-defying practice. Mashre proposed a theoretical and therefore rigorous knowledge of the literary work that must depend on a logic in the general sense of the word. To such a logic would fall the task of representing the form of necessity which preserves the real diversity which makes up the work. Obviously, this logic could not be based exclusively on the study of literary works. It would have to derive from all, other, all those other forms of knowledge which also pose the question of the organization of a multiple. The multiplicity of a work or a practice thus calls for a rigorous, coherent, logical, multidisciplinary, multidisciplinarity on the side of criticism for an assemblage of knowledge capable of reading the manifold organization of the practice. Due to its inner diversity and multiplicity, the work or practice gains specificity, and this specificity is the prerogative of its autonomy and necessitates a non-trivial knowledge to be properly processed and, and, and analyzed. Quote, literary works ought to be the object of a specific science, otherwise they will never be understood. And though various disciplines such as linguistics, the theory of art, the theory of history, the theory of ideologies, the theory of unconscious formations must all collaborate in this enterprise, for without them it would remain incomplete and would perhaps be impossible, yet they can in no sense replace this, spe this specific science of the literary work. It is important to recognize that literary texts make a novel use of language and ideology, perhaps the two are not so very different, by resting them in a new direction and, constrict and, and conscripting them into a project peculiar to them alone. Mashray specifies that it is, that it is the non-causal and non-reductive condition of a work or practice, its principle of rationality, which is the object of scrutiny. To know the conditions of a work is not to reduce the process of its production to merely the growth of a seed which contains all its future possibilities from the very beginning, a kind of genesis which is the reversed image of an analysis, to know the conditions of work is to define the real process of its constitution, to show how it is composed from a real diversity of elements which uh, give it substance. 
It is the mobility which makes the work possible and from which it emerges. Although it is not rigidly subordinated to a model, it, its progress is not random, but becomes an object, be, but becomes an object of knowledge. I cannot help but seeing in Mashray's object of knowledge a close ally of Arendt's thought thing. The former associating the work of art's process of production, its progress, diversity and mobility with epistemic activity on the side of the production of the text as well as on the side of the specific science of, of critical reception. The latter likewise conceiving the work of art as the bearer of epistemic activity as thought affected by itself as preceding, underlying and eluding thinking and knowledge alike. As much as the conceptual model of the work of art might contradict the open-ended, methodotic, meth methodically unresolved, closure-defying and forward-looking practice of the cultural producer, reconceived in terms of an aesthetic epistemology, it appears as something ultimately shared and collaborative, as a common thing, just like the documents of common epistemic practice pursued and made accessible in the research endeavors initiated time and again by Marion. Bringing Benjamin, Brecht, Arendt, and Mascheret to the table, I try to gesture at the junctions of production, knowledge, work, and art in a way that hopefully suggests possible modes of contextualization and criticism with regard to the practice of the cultural producer, which as Marion performs and realizes it with each, each of her collaborative, co collaborative research projects, exhibitionary essays, or written articles, is always a practice of epistemic mobility and diversity. Her reiterated turns to vernacular epistemologies, to informal e economies, to the knowledge practices of organic experts and specific intellectuals on the grounds of colonial histories and presence are key for this practice which, which through a material critique of epistemic hierarchies and epistemic violences as exerted by the agents and agencies of the precarization of cultural labor as well as of colonial modernity effectively reverses and inverts ideas of control and power. Originating in art's threatened utopian prospect of critical autonomy and skeptically relying on the resources of art worlds and art histories, Marion's manifold production is informed by aesthetic thinking and the specific science of art's condition, though strategically unhinged from the compulsory strictures of having to behave as art. Thank you.